Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Good to have you along today. Uh, the subject uh, today is how to protect yourself with doing documentation right. We've got two uh, presenters today, Kathleen Wyborn from DNVGL Business Assurance and Bill Bremer from Kestrel Televate LLC. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Yes, uh, type in the sidebar. Let us know where you're joining us from today. Um, it's always nice to know. Um, the, the webinar is being recorded as always. We will follow up afterwards with um, the slides, the recording, your certificate of attendance an hour or two after the webinar. Uh, as mentioned, one of the presenters today is Kathleen Wyborn from DMVGL Business Assurance. And DMVGL are a kind sponsor of Food Safety Fridays. And on that note, I'm going to play the sponsor's ads just for a couple of minutes. And then we'll be over to uh, meet Kathleen and Bill. Okay. See you in a couple of minutes. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Hello, Kathleen. Welcome. Hi. Good nice. morning. Good morning. Nice to have you along again. We've missed you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell the audience where you're joining us from today, Kathleen? Hi, I'm joining from Chicago, Illinois. So. And did you say before the, the snow plows are out? The snow plows are out. We did get hit the last two days. So. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, uh, Bill, is Bill next to you? Bill sure is. Hi, Simon. Hi, Bill. And uh, at the moment, you're, you're obviously next to Kathleen, but where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Chicago as well. A little different part of town than Kathy, but I travel all over the U.S. on food safety. Okay. Well, nice to have you along, Bill. Um, okay, I'll get your slides up now, and then we can get the presentation going, and I'll be back for the Q&A later. So we'll switch our webcams off now, and let's roll the presentation. Okay, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I see we have um, folks from all over the world, which is fantastic um, today. Um, I'm gonna give a short overview about DNVGL, who we are and what we do. 
Um, first of all, we're a foundation with our headquarters out of Oslo, Norway. We're a global company and we have 300 offices in 100 different countries. Um, 10,000 different certificates for the food and beverage industry alone um, that we have with both large multinationals and small, smaller companies. Um, and we partner with companies um, along with the ISO um, standards. So we do all the ISO standards and we also um, accredit hospitals um, for their um, accreditation for Medicare and Medicaid. Again, our um, global footprint, you can see here in the um, map here, we're located all over the world. Our purpose is to safeguard life, property, and the environment, and a vi our vision, trusted voice to tackle global transformations. Our values are we care, we share, and we dare. So you can see the footprint of our, our auditors. So we're pretty much located wherever um, companies are and wherever you need us. Some of the things we do, um, again, we do certification and verification. We do assessments. So we're spending a lot of time now with um, assuring the supply chains. So both from the um, food safety and social um, aspects, um, we also do training in all different aspects of the ISO standards and also um, food safety, GFSI, um, and social. DNV provides virtual audits. This is one thing that we've started um, in our repertoire of tools, um, which we find very useful for many of the many companies in many different ways, um, both from having auditors on site where the corporate office or the person involved, interested party can be sitting in their office and also see um, remotely the um, audit taking place. We can do document review or also we can even doing the virtual with the food safety quality manager on site and there is not an employee from DNVGL um, present. So we found it to reduce um, approximately 40% of the cost because a lot of um, cost is in travel reduce safety risks for being in unknown um, sites, um, reduce the environmental impact, which is important to everyone as far as the travel. We can have multi-person involvement. Um, the timing that we can start an audit is very quick. Um, improve planning flexibility because if we're not having to have people travel into the sites and reduce operational downtime. And what this means is for companies, they are no longer having to send if they want to send their auditor to a company to NVGL, um, they won't be there needing to travel also. And I'm going to turn it over to Bill right now, and I'm looking forward to a great presentation. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending wherever you are, whatever time it is, wherever you might be. And thank you, Simon. We're going to talk about how to protect your in the U.S. over uh, the last number of years with FISMA. Uh, uh, who is Kestrel Televate? We're a consulting advisory firm, and I like to think more on the advisory side, but we help companies to assess their needs for compliance, programs. Uh, obviously, we focus on FISMA and all the elements of FISMA, the rules, as well as GFSI and uh, ISO quality systems on the, the food safety side. We do similar environmental safety and health. We're really a full service uh, um, environmental uh, and safety and health uh, organization. We do government work as well as industry. And then we have data management uh, expertise that we use to help companies with their, uh, with their programs. Um, so the objectives of what we're talking about is understanding how to protect yourself by doing documentation right. And it may vary around the globe. A lot of this is US centric, but US is having a pretty pretty significant impact on, on global requirements. Uh, discuss strategies for simplifying documents and records. And we're gonna show you some graphics. So it's just not all me talking. Um, so it, documented programs are so critical and they became more critical with GFSI uh, internationally, starting in the early 2000s. And then it's moved more and more into the FISMA uh, written document requirements uh, that came out uh, with changes due to the FISMA law. 
So the requirements tend to be, you have to determine your requirements. You have to develop your programs. They have to be developed. You can't just list them on a contents list. And you have to ensure that the documentation is clear and correct and works. So you have to have adequate management and control over things like in the US for FISMA, preventive controls. It's pretty much moved into GFSI as well. And then you need to have qualified individuals. We're gonna make that plural to help run your program, specifically for the food safety plan and preventive controls, as well as audit, sanitation, foreign supplier verification, and now a big focus is intentional adulteration. Uh, GFSI alignment back to FISMA is very, very important because there's a reciprocal between the two and it's changed quite a bit. At one time, FISMA was trying to stay uh, separated from GFSI, but just between what FISMA expects and what GFSI wants, they're really commingled in some ways. And it's really good because they serve to uh, ensure comprehensive programs. The one thing is GFSI expects you to meet your, your regulatory obligations, whether it's uh, FISMA in the US or other countries, and GFSI uh, and the regulatory expects you to meet GFSI. So you have to uh, be held accountable to both as well as other areas as well. So alignment, what we ask uh, people to do or what we uh, advise people to do is consider internal applications that are familiar as they lay out their programs, arrange documents into registers. I'm gonna show you some examples of that to, to better organize them. And we also like the KISS principle. They can be a lot of documents, but if you keep them to the point and simple, it's much easier to manage them. Uh, confirm the sections to clarify the intended scope of compliance and indicate FISMA requirement uh, requires that, and you need to do it for GFSI as well, is you need to identify what you have to comply with and what you might not have to comply with. FISMA has that specifically in there. If you're not complying with any of the elements or the rules of FISMA, you state why you're not, and it could be in some type of addendum, but you need to cover that as well. Uh, document management, uh, we start with what we call a register and not everyone uses it. A lot of the companies we work with like it. And basically it's kind of a card catalog of your programs and it's a way to ensure you have them all. So confirm that all the program uh, documented requirements are met and it provides a record or a basis for a record of development. You keep uh, uh, you know records either on your documents or on, a, on another register or within the register of when you develop something, when you change something. So we lift, uh, what I'm gonna show you next, uh, basically when we set up a register, typically along the horizontals, uh, you'll have the checklist of the specific uh, uh, programs and procedures. And then across the top, we, we use a status uh, or action vertical uh, along the vertical, vertical axis. This is to maintain document numbers, version control, ultimately document management and document control. So here's a sample register. And you can see how the down, uh, numbers are down the left. I've simplified it into you know, areas like administration or HR. Uh, so you know, just for simplicity, but typically for GFSI register of just primary, primary documents, as well as FISMA too. We have almost 200 uh, items down the left and those would be core programs and then they could be broken down into sub programs as well. Across the top, we have the name, uh, status of development. It's complete, it's approved. Uh, what department has responsibility for it? Executive for the top one, and then program commitment, and then action scheduled for review or scheduled for internal audit, possibly. So that's kind of the layout we use. And what's nice about it, it's relatively simple. You can add items that you're, uh, that you're addressing for a particular um, number program and keep uh, everything well organized. Uh, and that's, that's the goal of it. Uh, document control. It's a tough area. We work with a lot of even large and small companies that they, if they lose control of their documents because they have not organized them into a register, uh, it's tough to get them back into, uh, into order. So we work with a content register. Uh, we'll include things on the food safety side, the food safety plan, hazard analysis, and preventive controls, which is really key, obviously, for, uh, for FISMA, as well as GFSI now as well. And then the procedures of various types. And of course, we may call our uh, procedures SOPs, GMPs, CGMPs under 
FISMA as well as PRPs and OPRPs for, uh, for GFSI. And you're able to call it what you want, really. You just have to define it. And then uh, to maintain the register, we work on aligning it to meet uh, the content requirements through so, a similar development process for things like uh, not just FISMA, but GFSI, the QMS requirements or customer requirements. It basically allows you to have, um, you know, if you use this register format, uh, a workbook type setup within, uh, within uh, Excel, as well as different sections of it broken down as you go down the horizontal side of things. So it's very powerful to keep things uh, organized and basically allows you to meet the requirements of all programs and ensure that they're adequately met. More importantly, if there's commonality, and there is quite a bit between ISO 9001 and GFSI of any type, as well as FISMA to a degree, it allows you to uh, kind of sh share the space on the content list or have some sub breakdown there to cover those different standards. Uh, this is what we'd call an alignment model. And we've moved to taking our registers into just say FISMA or GFSI into covering things as, as you see here, you know, across the top, FISMA, GFSI, QMS, uh, and customer requirements. Customer requirements are more and more important all the way around because they drive GFSI from the, um, uh, from the industry standard side, as well as uh, uh, they've moved more into having quality as an aspect of it at different levels, allows you to deal with that. And then FISMA lines up with these as well. FISMA doesn't necessarily call out all the various aspects of what you see in GFSI, but they basically indicate you need to do it. And if you don't, if you don't do it and you end up with a food problem, a recall, an outbreak, any of those type of things, an incident, uh, that would be a problem for you. So you have to, you should be looking across the scope of the different standards and regulations to ensure compliance. So the major standards that you wanna look at in sub-registers may include CASAP hazard analysis. We'd add preventive controls in there now. Uh, supplier qualification is a significant one. And right now under FISMA, and it's, it's a challenge for GFSI as well, the supply chain management is a big focus. It was part of the original law it was uh, pushed off a little bit from a compliance standpoint, and this will be a big year for uh, the supplier program requirements. Recall traceability is another big one. Early on in FISMA, I had a client that uh, had some issues. FDA came in. Uh, they weren't our client yet. They, we helped them to try to get out of their, their troubles. And uh, ultimately, because they did not have lot traceability, uh, FDA forced the recall and basically put them out of business because all their customers filed for credits, and it took two weeks for that company to go out of business. That was early on in FISMA. Um, another key issue is managing training and qualifications, and this is a tough one. Many times we run into organizations, even large companies, where they don't necessarily have the right qualifications. You have to have qualified personnel. The PCQI is one way of defining it, but that's for the overall program, the way it's, it's pretty well explained in FISMA. However, it also calls out that you have, so that'd be the FSP, food safety plan. You have to have people that are qualified that is in compliance to begin with, or maybe you never get there. Your program will likely degrade. Implementation will be more difficult and less successful. So it's a big issue. And well-developed training programs and records must be continually updated. And a big issue is today, the level of uh, qualified people is not, you know, consistent with the market needs. So you have to be careful about keeping whoever you have based on replacing people in turnover that they meet the requirements. And this is a training matrix. We developed this a long time ago with some of the, the training entities out there, but we do a lot of training as well. And a lot of times companies are asked to show, well, how do you do your training? How do you break it down? Not just the training records specifically or the programs or the certificates. Sometimes that's all companies have. The matrix really helps to explain what you do for a lead PCQI person, what a team member of your food safety team uh, would, go, would be required to have, what management's required to have. And sometimes that gets confusing because you have lead people working for management that are more at that PCQI level, as well as in the technical people that might be doing uh, uh, managing uh, metal detection, calibration, and things, and then operations as well. 
FISMA requires all people, and so does GFSI, to know the food safety risks of their jobs. So that's a big issue. The matrix helps to describe that. Um, audit inspection readiness. Sometimes programs are based just on this without doing everything else you need to do. However, you have to make provisions for this. And if you really are kind of rehearsing and going through a readiness review, it's a great way of doing an overall review of your program. Some companies do it just based on, on the physical evidence. So nowadays, you not only have the, uh, the GFSI surveillance audit or the possible FDA or health department audit. Uh, now, many of these are unannounced or can be unannounced. GFSI has provisions for unannounced. That was done as a way to get closer to what the, the regulators want. Then FDA, they can come and they can inspect whenever they feel the need to. So it's very, very important to be able to be ready for audits uh, whenever they may occur. So it's a key issue. Uh, conduct audit inspection readiness is a key thing to do. Um, it's funny because if you don't have the physical evidence, obviously you're not in, uh, ironic I should say, in compliance. The other thing is if it's not documented and you don't have records, you're not in compliance either. So you could have a good physical evidence, but you need to have all your documents, programs, and records. Uh, that's the evidence I was talking about. You have to have it in place all the time. Uh, you have key areas you need to look at. They could be preventive controls, which you should only have a few of. It could be CCPs, critical control points as well, that still may have a place, right? Because there's some, some products where uh, you, uh, you don't know how the downstream controls will work and you need to have like a kill step with temperature uh, or a cooling temperature to ensure against the growth of bacteria and those type of things. But all these programs have to be fully implemented uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and otherwise you're at risk. So practice is, is the key to having the best level of readiness and matching up the documentation with the physical results in a food processing plan or operation is really a key focus to make sure you're, uh, you're in compliance. This is an internal audit schedule example. A lot of companies do internal audits. We go into some pretty sophisticated companies. They don't manage them or from a scheduling standpoint and monitoring standpoint very, very well. Doesn't have to be very difficult. So here we list some of the top ones you need to be concerned about. Mock recall, pre-operation or job change in some, some organizations. Environmental monitoring uh, is, a, is a newer focus area under FISMA. They'll be looking at that and having those programs. GFSI added it up, uh, added it into the updates that are going on right now. Sanitation, very key. And you have to have uh, a validated sanitation process, both on how you do it, when you do it, and the chemicals or whatever you're using to do the sanitation. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that FISMA happened. If you look at the uh, studies that led into FISMA, proper sanitation was a key issue. So along with that, when you're doing uh, internal audits, you're looking for nonconformity, and they could be uh, true nonconformances, they could be more uh, corrections, or they could be just improvements. And managing those is really important, and rating those is really important. So again, I use some of the same examples from the previous internal audit. Sanitation, you need to inspect. You look for kappas. Uh, we're getting um, signs of bacterial contamination after the process. You have to manage it until it's closed, which means you may be double cleaning some things. We've worked with some fairly large companies where they use transports in their commissaries. And uh, in the course of our work, we found out that they weren't sanitizing their transports, that they were using for multiple uses, vegetables, proteins, and things like that. And uh, it was a big shock to them. What happened is their uh, sanitation uh, dilutions were too low to do a kill on the bacteria. And this is a number of years ago, and they reacted to that very quickly. They had no problems because it was a cooked product, but those are the type of things that you come up with. Uh, when you do internal audits or audits, uh, external, we help our clients with that, as well as determining nonconformances. You have to track them and correct them. Management of change. So that issue I just gave you, part of that was we needed to in, improve our sanitation chemical potency, right? So. Changes uh, must lead to improvement 
and then you have to revalidate and correct systems. Uh, you use that within your food safety plan. A lot of times when a simple thing occurs, you might have uh, various documents within your food safety management system, what your food safety plan is. It's kind of the global term for that. You have to update everything that needs to be updated. And then um, if you get new processes and equipment right now with, I'd say, the hyper development of products with different calorie counts and labels, there's a lot of management of change going on, which you have to manage well. And typically, that's a multifunctional activity. Could include marketing and sales as well as uh, the food tech side of things or engineering, certainly. Uh, so everything has to be brought together when you're dealing with a management of change. What we look for there is for people to, uh, or organizations to have, uh, have kind of a quorum on making a change. And some of the key programs certainly include your HACCP or hazard analysis, your food safety plan, and the procedures need to be updated. Probably one of the most important parts of, uh, of uh, management of change is making sure that training occurs prior to as the new procedure or equipment is put into place, whatever it is, the process changes, or have it concurrent with the change, and it needs to be recorded. That would be an area certainly where an inspector would look. We put in a new piece of equipment, we're gonna have higher output. We're gonna make more money on the product, and they may look to see make, to make sure that all the training is in place for all the food safety requirements and controls of whatever that change is. The management oversight. Whoops, sorry. Didn't want to work sometimes, that's working real well, uh, the advance. Um, so there are reanalysis requirements, and some of it is based on either time or uh, activity or whatever your programs call for. So this has to be handled well. This leads into management of change as you reanalyze your programs. And the determinations of the program changes that need to be made are you know, determined at that time. Uh, and when I say management, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the plant manager level or the director of operations or even the CEO of the C-suite. This is management by the, uh, the programs. Uh, changes uh, must result in a validated, implemented, and verified effective change according to the food safety programs. Maybe not the speeds or the output, but basically the food safety risk controls. And then organization updated based on objectives, job expectations, qualification that I mentioned, training. So the objectives need to change uh, as well. So the reality is the management um, interaction would be, FISMA indicates it, but they put a lot of onus on the, uh, the site managers uh, and the PCQIs and the rest of uh, the PCQIs plural. Um, and then GFSI has the management review requirement where you need to conduct those typically at least annually. We might re recommend the same for FISMA, but as you're developing programs, you should do it more often. So management needs to have visibility. And the one thing with FISMA particularly is management can be held accountable if they're not really uh, interacting enough to know what needs to change. GFSI would expect it too. Uh, so you could be, you could have some type of uh, non-compliance penalty under FISMA or with GFSI, if you lose your certificate, and we talk to companies that sometimes don't get their certificates on time, if they're uh, into a major uh, supply chain lead company with regard to the stream and what they sell, the, they may be off the, uh, the qualified supplier list until they get their certification. So it's, it's important economically as well. Food safety, of course, is the most important part. Then FISMA reanalysis. FISMA has some things built into it uh, that literally are gotchas. And some of it is, and talk about it all the time, you have to figure out how you're gonna handle it. But uh, uh, if you go back on why FISMA was developed, they hired a, a, a both FDA and Congress, uh, uh, with Congress, they hired a group called Eastern Research, and they looked at everything in the mid or early to mid 2000s, what was wrong with food safety in the US? And they determined a number of things. One thing is that the procedures may have been written, the GMPs a long time ago never updated with all the changes, they didn't have management of change. Um, and the programs were really not fully written and documented. So that first bullet shows that, yeah, you must update 
and review your procedures every two years, even if you don't make a change. You may be just verifying that they're still good. And that's fine, as long as you can prove it. Um, or if you've made changes, it's, it's also a time where you're gonna reassess and say, whoops, we did make changes here. We have to change uh, our documented programs and maybe our, our, um, our validation and verification of whatever that is. Could be metal detection, could be temperature control, could be things like our, that are pre preventive controls as well hygiene and things of that nature. So on a two-year basis, procedures must be up to date in the U.S. And if you're a supplier to a U.S. company, the supply chain requirements would push that back to a foreign supplier as well. It should be part of the, their matching program. And then for the overall programs they put in that you need to update your uh, uh, overall programs or review it. You may not update, but review it for whatever changes every, uh, every three years. So these updates are important. Um, another area is if you find a nonconformance that presents a food safety risk, another thing that FISMA put in was uh, you, have to, you have to control it. You may make a change and manage it to eliminate whatever that issue is. Could be a leaky roof. Could be a, a problem with your settings on your metal detector. Could be a problem with the, uh, the temperature elevation of product within a cooking. Um, you know, uh, situation. But once you make the change, you turn up the heat, you, you corrected the settings, you repaired the roof, within seven days you need to update your programs and it's gotta be documented. So you have to have a record of it. So this is a form of corrective action that FISMA put into place. And then you really have to, if you just did kind of a spot correction of say the roof in an area or the oven, if you're cooking, then you have to look at your overall program for managing either the building or the cooking, and you have 90 days to update that and prove that you have that. So there's, these are things that as FISMA unrolls, the inspectors will be looking at. And if, if, you're, if it's not an inspection, it could be a criminal investigation if you have sent product out that may have caused either injury or death. So everything has to be validated, uh, audited, re-audited after it's put into place. So there might be a number of re-audits of any of these situations with changes, and then everything has to be validated and verified. And it sounds very complicated, but if you have maintain good documentation, you use the registers, you control your uh, um, audits or your uh, corrective actions and monitor those, it's not as difficult as, as it would see. You should really have very few. And this, this is typically under some level of PCQI oversight. Overall food safety plan in the US is a PCQI kind of the general one, but you also have to have audit function. And concurrently, GFSI and internal programs are sub, uh, subject to similar, subjected to similar requirements. Reanalysis must encompass all aspects of the food safety plan or the food safety management system. It could be a very, very fairly rapid process. However, it's best to have uh, multiple functions involved in multiple people. But you have to look at your document management and control. A lot of times the changes lead to a loss of document management. You have to have very, very good, well-developed internal audit records. CAPA has to be monitored and managed. We run into situations where people really don't understand CAPA and they'll either not list corrective actions that they need to, to address or they will make too many items a corrective action. Uh, in the early days of GFSI, remember, um, at, uh, within technical working groups, the Europeans uh, talking about the U.S. and say, you guys in the U.S., you never close out your corrective actions. You continue to manage around them. And that, I think they were right, because we see that a lot too, mainly because Europeans are smaller and they take uh, kind of better care of the way they source their food locally. That's changing too, though. And... Uh, uh, it's a big area to make sure that you're managing it correctly. And then record keeping and change updates are very, very important. And then uh, customer complaints are a key, key area um, in response to market complaints as well. We have things like the romaine lettuce in the U.S., which just is a plaguing problem. We've had it before with leafy greens and other produce. Part of it is produce is kind of set back within FSMA, but uh, but you basically need to look at these things if you're in these businesses uh, that there are problems on a market level and address those because that's part of the process of using science-based information and the basic feedbacks to 
eliminate a complaints, prevent them for you, but really not uh, distribute any product that's contaminated. And then you need to do corrections, and then you need to re internal audit them and uh, ensure that all the nonconformances are closed. Um, all other elements of the food safety plan under FISMA and other requirements need to be addressed through reanalysis and update. Validation. We get confused sometimes between validation and verification, and interestingly enough, some organizations define them differently. But validation is to make sure that, that whatever your controls are, or your programs are, work. Um, they're required by FDA, FISMA, GFSI. Uh, it's part of the CAPA monitoring process that when you, when you implement a corrective action that you validate. Uh, you have to have temporary oversight when you're doing that too. Uh, so if you need to make a bigger change, uh, get a better piece of equipment or uh, make some major adjustments to either building, you need to put things into place to ensure that you're operating uh, and making food safely. Uh, root cause analysis is another area that we see which is a weakness. All of a sudden, Big companies are really looking into how they handle root cause analysis to come up with whatever the corrective action is and document it. It's got to be documented, validated, and recorded. And it fits into the, the, uh, the plan, do, check, and act continuous improvement model, which both uh, GFSI and FISMA as well, they expect you to, uh, to make those changes and have all the proof that you've done it and that you're not ever releasing product that could be of ri uh, uh, a risk to the public. Uh, everything has to be current and up-to-date. I use that 24-hour-a-day, uh, 365 days a year. It has to always be up-to-date. Otherwise, you're at risk for some type of nonconformance or possibly uh, issue with the regulators. Uh, continuous improvement. Although it's not spelled, spelled out in FISMA so much, it is in a lot of the GFSI standards. It's all about continuous improvement. If you find improvements that you need to make, to make a safer food, you need to implement it. We see this all the time in companies like with Listeria and drains, they know it's there. They don't necessarily control it. Uh, they have to figure out how to control it. And there's ways of doing it. It's really bad form not to do it because you can do that with the proper sanitation. So improvements are an imperative to effective compliance. Uh, you have to meet requirements at all times. You have to have sustained improvement programs, use root cost analysis, and have all the records in place. You need to monitor all corrective actions to a close. Another area that we see as important and changing both regulatory-wise and industry standard-wise is harmonizing excuse me, social, uh, certain programs like social responsibility, environmental health and safety, which can lead to food safety issues as well. Fair trade is another big issue out there where a lot of the major companies in the food chain expect fair uh, trade compliance. Fraud is another one. And that's definitely a, a food safety or authenticity issue. It could be vegetable oil, could be spices, could be products cut with uh, dangerous materials, which has happened over time. And then we have some banned materials and banned minerals from different parts of the world. Um, these may be customer requirements, but they should be added in. And these can be added into that register that we talked about earlier. Records. We say we can almost, if we go through a uh, food safety operation and we see the records that may include uh, work instructions, we can do most of our audit with that if they are well done. So you want to make sure your records are in order if there's work instructions as part of it, even better. Not that many years ago, one of the biggest things FDA looked at was your receipt of uh, inspection, including it was refrigerator frozen product. Key Sometimes that gets pushed down in the uh, operation, having them qualified to do it, and basically making sure that all forms that you use for records are completed and verified. Someone fills it out, maybe their superiors verify it, and then quality or food safety can verify it again. So it's multiple verifications. So we have this linear view that that's what the uh, regulators are expecting to see, and that's how they're going to rate how well an operation is. So records then become even more and more important uh, for various areas, and you have to have those lined up with the programs. Uh, supporting evidence of meeting all requirements are part of the records, but as well as the CAPAs like we talked about. Resource issues and continual problem areas, 
if you don't have the qualified in, individual available because you don't have enough of them, you don't have backups, you need to you need to make sure you have enough so those backups are identified. Uh, key findings reported to management need to be recorded effectively. We work with com some companies, they have an incident communication process. It's kind of like an e a hot email. Those are very, very important. If we find we lose temperature or we get have some level of contamination to notify everyone to, to prevent uh, you know, contaminated product from leaving, or even more importantly, if it did leave the control of the company, it's a big regulatory issue to respond to it with either uh, a uh, withdrawal or a recall. Uh, jurisdictions uh, for management for change and resources need to be supported. Records must be maintained and available. All issues must be inclo uh, included, enclosed if necessary with records, or be subjected to further audit and possibly root cause. Um, simplify uh, uh, document records, leverage uh, available information technology. Document management is very important. We see a lot of document management systems that just become a, a pool of unorganized documents that are hard to get to. Can't be that. And then you also, so you have to have it organized so you can get to the documents, having some type of register for the documents separate from the uh, overall program register. You have to have a validation process. All systems information must be backed up for inspection. US, uh, excuse me, FDA expects you to have two years of manufacturing records available within 24 hours or basically on demand. If you don't have it, that's a non-compliance and it could be longer than two years. So we all say two years plus. So you need to have, if it's in commerce longer, if it's something that's gonna be in commerce for five years, you need to keep those records for five years. The organization also must uh, determine that record retention program, which can be looked at through FDA, uh, FDA FISMA or GFSI. And then legal uh, authorities will stress that you should have as little of that information as possible because it does become a legal risk if you have too much of it. You may have kept records you shouldn't have kept. It may show that you had a non-compliance three or four years ago. That can be a risk. And then simplify your document records. The more you you keep it simplified, simplify the uh, the record retention um, and data. Uh, you know the the process for uh, for uh, maintaining your your records. They have to be there has to be integrity there. They need to be backed up typically on multiple servers. And then you have to have the process to uh, uh, audit and edit your document your documents and document management under document management. We also want to look at the enterprise risk. So everything we're talking about should go back to what is our enterprise risk. It could be a small issue or maybe thought of as a small issue, receiving product and who you're getting it from, maybe changing the supplier. But it could be a big risk, right? Because it could cause a major issue. So these are the type of things you want to look for in your programs and uh, help to justify what you're doing. And this leads to updated objectives as determined. And you need objectives for FISMA just like you do for GFSI. And then alignment of systems, we talked about that. So you need to ensure general food compliance, EHS, other regulatory, those other areas I talked about are all very important and they should be part of the document uh, management. And then qualified personnel. There are sp specific requirements and you think of it being one, no, you have to have quite a few and you may have different ones between the overall food safety plan, but you may have a uh, specific one separate for audit, sanitation, food defense and inter, uh, internal adulteration. So a summary is um, you need to have a complete register. You have to show document management and control with all the right documents. You must validate and verify. You must deal with management of change, corrective actions, show continuous improvement, and commissioning and pre-op integrity of every time you're gonna produce food product. The organization has to have resources to meet that and then be ready for your audits and insp uh, inspections. And that's that's the end of the, the PowerPoint. Um, I think we're gonna go to Q&A now. Is that right, Simon? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, yeah, if you can switch your webcam on and uh, we'll stop sharing the slides. Uh, just to, to set Kathy and me together. We're here. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> We've worked together for a long time, more than 10 years. <laughs> Good. Uh, right. Well, uh, first question from uh, Octavia 
can you see that one in the sidebar? Uh, are we required to conduct internal audits during non-production times, i.e. layoff due to lack of work? I would say yes, because you have to maintain all your physical elements. So if you're not working, actually it's a good time to do certain internal audits. You still certainly want to be doing them during operation as well. Okay, and uh, what about Smita? Shiva, Shiva Swam is asking, can you elaborate on Smita? As far as documentation requirements? Um, uh, I think, first and foremost, what does Smita stand for? I think, not first a, and foremost. Not a, it's a, a social um, assessment that's used yeah. um, in the industry. Right, okay. Oh, my Lord, Lara, I think uh, it's a bit beyond the scope of the audit. If you Google Smeter, I think you'll find uh, a wealth of information on um, on that subject. Uh, okay, Craig Brooks is asking, uh, based on the future of VQIP, how much of existing documentation and process will be effective or will it require a more expansive documentation process? I would say it's meant to actually reduce it because the certification that's accepted by the qualified certifiers will take away documentation required through the supply chain. So it'll standardize things. It won't, it won't necessarily make risk higher, but it'll make it easier to prove uh, qualification for, uh, for foreign supplier to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just remind us, VQIP, that acronym, what does it it's stand for? It's a Voluntary for? Qualified Importer Program under FISMA. And um, if everybody doesn't know, just as of last week, FDA put the announcement out, and DNVGL is now an accredited certifier for this VQIP. If you're, okay. if you're importing a lot from various suppliers, or you're importing a lot from very few international suppliers, it makes things work a lot more easily for one supplier. Okay, very good. And Shiva, uh, just a couple more. IA, I think that's internal audit. Uh, is that correct? IA? No, intentional adulteration. Oh, sorry. Whoops. Which is a, big, <laughs> it's a huge push throughout the overall supply chain, and it is right. a big push for uh, FDA in 2020, along with some other areas. And I'm not going to guess then what FSP is. Food safety plan. That's right. the uh, core section 126 requirement. Uh, it's one, uh, under 117 of what FISMA requires. It's the heart of it, but there's a lot of other parts of, of it as well. Okay. Uh, next one, Carol, US question. What is the brand owner's responsibility for documentation and auditing compared to the coal packer stroke manufacturers? It, it's really the same. I mean, as far as the requirements for, around food safety in the, the plans you're writing. So um, there's no no difference. When we go into audit uh, a co-packer for any of the standards, or um, it would be the same as if we're auditing um, a, a brand manufacturer. Yeah. Under FISMA, it's kind of interesting. If you're using contract, contractors, you're the branded company. They're working for you. You're contracting there operation but it's a double double whammy they have to be in full compliance as well as you have to make sure they're in compliance okay that's clear uh deborah some suppliers are only giving me the food defense statement not the whole plan they are saying fda says it should not be shared what is your opinion i would say it depends on confidentiality because one of the things you want in there is you don't want it out to the world right however we will recommend having a summary where they issue a declaration, check off what they have, and confirm that the products are being effectively manufactured without uh, food defense or intentional adulteration being a risk. Okay, and Mabel, you mentioned a particular example in CAPA where people are listing too many actions. Any strategies you suggest to cope with this challenge? Yes, you need to have a program to it's kind of like going through severity and likelihood with HACCP. You need to determine what is a true risk that could result in contaminate or a contaminated product injury or death, or uh, or it's not. 
And what companies do is they, they, they want to put things in their campus, so they'll put something in that might be a quality issue. It might be a, pro, a package that doesn't look right, but it's still hermetically sealed. That shouldn't be a cat, cat, uh, 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 corrective action. That should be a correction or possibly an improvement. That's just you know, a brief example. If it doesn't belong at the higher level, you don't want to put it there because then you have to manage things uh, to the end of it, and it creates a lot of work. And if you have a lot of them, it'll really affect how you're uh, overall managing your programs. Okay. Sujit, what should be record retention time for minimum and maximum legal documents, process records, quality analysis records, etc.? Please elaborate it. As far as document retention, minimum um, two years. We usually see five years um, and up to 10 years. And each company has it a little bit differently, but um, minimum two years. And it has a lot to do with the le your, um, your product um, viability and the life cycle that it's in. So you want to have it go all through commerce before um, you start destroying any kind of documents. Okay. Uh, Tiago, do we need COAs for every delivery, and he's clarified up above, a delivery of ingredients, or just the letters of continuing guarantee of each supplier? Is that already enough for an SQF audit? It depends on your risk, but it's preferred to have a COA, uh, COA in a letter of uh, guarantee. The letter and guarantee wouldn't be for every order. That would be for kind of the contracted length of time. Could be a month, could be a year. C of A is for per lot, and you really need it. Otherwise, you've got to do additional testing or approve the safety of the product mm -hmm. or the raw material. Yeah. Okay. Rajiv, uh, can you explain the difference between controlled and uncontrolled documents? A controlled, a controlled doc, and it depends. A controlled document um, usually it has a date and time stamp um, on it that it is um, back to the original. Um, the reason why there's the control of documents is so important is with um, it's part of the change management process. And if and what's written in there, um, if a document is um, stamped that it's original, it's the original document, or if it's printed. Um, if you put it out in circulation sitting at somebody's desk, you, know, you don't know if somebody else has changed it. So um, there's, I've seen many ways that different companies has maintained their control of documents, but it, it is the, the reason behind it is to make sure you've got the right information and it hasn't been changed. Yeah, some uncontrolled documents can also be things like that are reference materials you use. You can list them in your program procedures. It could be operating manuals for equipment that are big books. So you reference those, and they're uncontrolled, but they're included in the food safety plan. Yeah. Okay, Colleen, if we source through a broker, do they need uh, FSP, food safety plan? The question for the, is the broker required, or? Um, if we source through a broker, so we purchase through a broker, do the, does the broker need a, an F, food safety plan? It depends on if they are the importer of record. And you have to identify that according to FISMA. And a lot of times in some situations, nobody wants to be the importer of record. So it comes down to whoever is ultimately paying for the product, but really they should be pushing it back to the supply chain. So a lot of times brokers will commingle the coffee and things like that. You have to have control over that and determine who's responsible. And actually green coffee is kind of under this now. Who, who's responsible for the food safety. So someone's got to take responsibility. And if you're buying it, you have to make sure that that importer record is there. Otherwise, you're out of compliance with foreign supplier. Okay, good. Uh, Susan, where can we find guidance or how to respond to a social media consumer correspondence re our launch products? What are the FDA stroke FISMA requirements? <laughs> That's a, tough one. <laughs> That's a very tough one. Social media makes everything a lot more difficult. Yeah. I don't know if the FDA is getting into it, but it can certainly be something that could harm you, I think, more than help you. Hopefully it helps you, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's a tough question. Oh, okay, basically, you need to have uh, communication plans, internal and external. That would be external communication. And if it is an issue in your industry, you may need to seek legal guidance and maybe some expertise in the marketing side to figure out how you're going to address it. Okay. Thank you. And was the how how to measure management commitment through inspection of documents? Your views. That's a tough one too. I, I mean, it's really through the through the um, interviews and the um, through documents. That, I mean, it could be stated, but an auditor will want to see that commitment um, through interviews with employees um, when they're auditing, or through the managers themselves being in attendance at an opening or closing meeting, um, their actions. Um, just the paperwork alone um, is really hard to, to measure that. It's very holistic, because you'll see if they have enough people, if they're qualified people, they'll see the conditions of the plant, the operations and the programs. The, the management review on the GFSI side covers that, as well as having a good food safety policy as part of your business policies, as well as objectives, annual objectives, training, solving problems, could only be three or four of those. It's, it's light, but that'll help to identify the commitment of management. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan is asking, can you provide an example of correction versus corrective action based on the question about too many CAPA actions? So I use that example of packaging. So say it's packaging, it could be for a high risk protein product. If it's not hermetically sealed, if it's exposed, uh, during the process, whatever's causing that, either the packaging material or the process itself or damage along the way, that would be a corrective action. That would have to be solved immediately. If it's just an ugly seal, but it's a good seal, that would be a correction, as long as it's hermetically sealed. Okay. Um, I think, I'm just wondering whether we've already covered this one. Uh, Rene, Rene, agent and broker COAs for every lot shipped. What about the continuing guarantee? Is this acceptable not to have COA with every lot? Is it ever acceptable? It just means you've got to do more testing, you said before, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you could get a COA for multiple lots that come in over days, for example, as long as the same lot. That COA would be good as long as the test and release of the products uh, that are involved, even though they're they're uh, uh, brought in over a period of time, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be per shipment. But it's not a bad idea to have that C of A for every shipment. And the letter of guarantee is is more of a longer term period type thing. Could be a year. These are all the products you're buying from us. This is our letter of uh, guarantee, and then you normally update that with your annual uh, contract review with your food supplier and uh, get an update on the letter of guarantee. Or if you think something's missing from the letter of guarantee, you may want to add it on if you're the, uh, the customer. Okay, next, uh, Sujit, invalidation program stroke activity. What should be the most basic elements of documentation required for validation? Um, if, it's, if it's something that you're testing and measuring, could be sanitation. So I'm going uh, sanitation, swabbing, we're actually uh, identifying, you know, there's, with genome sequencing, you can get down to the, you know, to the species pretty easily these days. But you want to verify if you're uh, sanitizing against listeria or salmonella or E. coli or anything else that the process is working. So you have to set up a program to make sure you're testing those areas. Same thing with uh, with, say, metal detection, which is so broadly used, especially in the U.S., what you need to do is you need to make sure that metal detector is working correctly. So you use challenge pieces, and then you recalibrate it. Internally, you have to have the resources that know how to do that, and then you have to keep those records as well to prevent any type of uh, metal contamination. There's been some pretty big ones in this last year with major companies, so it's not like metal detection is, is out there and functioning at the level it needs time. Okay. Uh, Omalara just mentioned there, as a regulator, we always request a COA for every supply. Um, we wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> Thiru, a lot. Excuse me if I get your name wrong. Thiru Varangan, if you could, what are the document control applications 
ERPs you would suggest for electronic document management? ERP, if you use it correctly, can make things a lot easier for you, obviously with a lot of traceability. But literally when you, you're issuing jobs to produce the product, you can include all the GMP requirements, all the job change and pre-op on it. And we don't see that a lot out there. Preventive maintenance is another one. Sometimes we see it in the big ERP system. Other times companies do it in a very informal way or a secondary system that's not integrated. But if you know your ERP, they can call me. We can we can give a lot of a lot of advice on using your ERP to minimize the amount of documents, control it better. Okay. Uh, Suji, is shredding the only method of record disposal uh, of FISMA related records? They, I mean, they can't be retrievable. So I, I, I can't say that shredding is the only way. Um, you could, you could use it for co-energy and burn it probably if you're using some type of heat source and things like that. But you have to fully, like Kathy said, you have to totally ensure that it's destroyed. It's destroyed. Okay, Deborah, they keep coming the questions. Deborah, I have COA with each load. Do I, as the FSVP, need to have each COA of all shipments, or can I just have an example for FDA in keeping documentation? You definitely need one for each shipment for FISMA. Uh, yeah. every, every shipment, every lot has to be included. So, so it's just not the shipment. You could have five five lots of material and a shipment, you need to have the CFAs for each lot. All right. Along with all the other information. Okay. Ellen, can copy holders have documents in electronic copy or should they be a hard copy? Well, electronic copies are fine. Electronic copies are fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Pradeep, um, does the HACCP system uh, obsolete version is the HACCP system obsolete due to the introduction of Harpsy? Not at all. Harpsy actually was kind of a temporary designation, hazard analysis preventive controls, before the PCQI was adopted by uh, by uh, by FDA for FISMA. Uh, so HACCP didn't really go away. HACCP uh, can still be called HACCP. Uh, I remember a meeting that I was at a conference and the FDA was there. And a lot of the, the HACCP programs met the uh, food safety plan requirements of FISMA. And what FDA said is, uh, and they had preventive controls in there, which is one of the key changes, they said, just call your HACCP plan your food safety plan. And you could subtitle it HACCP hazard analysis. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and Tessa, when it comes to customer complaints, what are the priorities with documentation? For sure, um, I mean, one of the priorities is around the consumer food safety and to make sure that there's a plan in place and what the reaction to um, these type of um, incidents so that that is all planned out as far as who to contact and you have every everybody's um, for crisis management, what, what is involved in that. And, and who to contact, what what actions are taken. Um, is it to um, contact a CV, the FDA? It depends on the severity. Yeah. The, the issue with the severity, too, is if you release product in the U.S., even from outside the U.S., that you feel is contaminated and you can't prove it's not, you need to, within 24 hours, enter into the FDA reporting registry so they have visibility for it, and they can act on it if they need to. And then you have to do all your... Uh, traceability and withdrawals. If you don't do that, and if you let that linger, you're really in violation of the law and could get some pretty strong uh, response from the FDA. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we seem to have uh, reached the end of the question. So we've gone a little bit over, but uh, much appreciated for staying. The audience and uh, you both, Kathleen and Bill, have uh, enjoyed it. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, you can come back again then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much to uh, Bill Bill from uh, Kestrel Televate LLC and Kathleen Wyborn from DMV GL Business Assurance. Uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Bye-bye. Okay, you. take care.
Right, ladies and gents, I'm uh, going to load your certificate of attendance in the sidebar, print it and sign it, or open it in an image editing software and type your name. Um, thanks for your attendance today. Um, I'll be issuing the slides and the recording afterwards. Um, okay. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great yeah. Friday. Our have, information's uh, on the last slides too if they have any questions for us in follow-up. Yeah, we'll uh, include the contact details in the follow-up email, and it is on the slides as well. So, okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. See you on the next one.